right. Everybody can hear me all right? Perfect, excellent. Thank you so much for coming, especially given the beautiful weather that we have outside today. Thank you so much for coming inside to hear us talk today about insect diversity in Minnesota. So let's get into it. Uh, to begin with, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background on uh, what I do. So my name is Robin Thompson. I am the curator of the University of Minnesota Insect Collection. For anyone who's not familiar with the concept of an insect collection, it's sort of like a library, but instead of managing books, I manage insect specimens. So the, universe, the University of Minnesota Insect Collection has a little over 4 million individual insect specimens that we house. It represents over 50,000 different insect species. And I care for and maintain those specimens to make sure that they are available um, for research, for education, for outreach purposes. We have research visitors who come to the collection to use them for their projects, um, sort of gleaning all sorts of different insights from the specimens. Uh, we ship specimens out on loan. We try to make sure that the collection is as active and useful to the research community as possible. That's the whole point of it. It's not necessarily meant to be a stamp collection that just looks pretty and is preserved in perpetuity. It's meant to be a living and breathing resource. Uh, so that is what I do. And then let's see, what are my other notes at this point? All right, so. Let's get into insects. For Let's do a brief uh, revisit on what is an insect. Maybe for anybody who doesn't have a deep understanding of what insects are. Um, does anyone have any guesses about what defines an insect? When I say insect versus any other creepy crawly, what do I mean? Six legs. Six legs. Six legs. That's very good. So insects should have six legs. There should be three pairs of legs. Anyone else have any rules that define insects or any guesses? Way over by the window. Antennae, they should have a single pair of antennae. That's a really good one. Not everybody knows that one. Super good one. Any last rules for what makes an insect unique? Three body parts. Do you know what they are? Head, thorax, and abdomen. That is correct. So that first one, that first body segment is a head. All insects have a head, and the head is not merged with other body parts. It is a head in its own right. The head is used for a lot of sensory input. So that's where we find things like the eyes, the antennae, the mouth parts. That's a lot of how the insect is perceiving its environment and interacting with its environment around it. <laughs> we've got the eyes, we've got that antennae, the mouth parts, and we have a thorax. All insects have a thorax. Not all arthropods, not all invertebrates have a thorax, but all insects have a thorax. And that thorax is made up of three subsegments. So we've got three sections to our thorax. And the thorax is the source of locomotion for insects. There's a lot of muscle in there. That's where we find those six legs. We should have one pair of legs per subsegment of the thorax. That's where we get the three pairs. That's also where we see the wings. We should have two pairs of wings on an insect. And they're showing up on the middle section and on the hind section, but never on the hind section. Of course, there's always exceptions to the rules in biology. Insects have tons of exceptions to the rules, and some of you have probably seen insects that didn't have any wings. So some insects have secondarily lost those wings. Sometimes we don't see complete wing sets on insects, but historically, evolutionarily, all insects have those two pairs of wings, and they're always, always, always on the thorax. So when you see weird drawings of insects where the legs and the wings are maybe coming out of the abdomen or just out from underneath the head, um, you can all laugh to yourselves because you know now that that is an anatomical <laughs> and again, because there's exceptions to the rules, we have a whole group of insects known as the true flies, where the hind wings have evolved into this little structure called a halter. So instead of being a functional wing used for flying, it has been reduced into what looks like kind of like a little ball on a stick, sort of like a little um, like a golf ball, a, golf ball, a little peg that the ball sits on. The tee looks like a little golf tee. It's in the exact same place where the hind wing would be but it's used to help the fly orient itself. Evolutionarily, that hind wing on a fly, things like mosquitoes, horse flies, deer flies, blow flies, that has been turned into a halter instead of hind wing. We have our head, we have our thorax, and as we were informed, we also have our abdomen. So those are the three main body sections that we use to define insects. They are the only animals that have that body plan, a distinct head, a distinct thorax, and a distinct abdomen. And the abdomen is where a lot of internal processes take place. Like here we have the reproduction, digestion, osmoregulation, a lot of squishy internal stuff is going on in the abdomen. So knowing that, 
you can all can tell me why these are not insects. We're seeing the wrong number of body segments. We're seeing the wrong number of legs. We're seeing the wrong number of antennae. We're not seeing wings. All sorts of reasons why a lot of times these might be called bugs. People refer to these as bugs because they're creepy crawly. But we all know that these are not insects. They're something else. So we reminded ourselves of how we define what an insect is. How many insects, in terms of species numbers, are there? That is such a big question because insects are such a huge entity. So this is a pie chart of all of life. We've got insects and arthropods, we've got animals, we've got algae, we've got plants, we've got um, basically everything alive is on this pie chart. And if we look, this whole sort of like bottom section in the blue, insects, it says 925,000, that's actually out of date. This picture is probably at least 10 years old, probably older. We know about a million described insect species in science, probably a little over. So insects are making up a massive amount of life. I think it's about 60% of this pie chart. I think it's exactly 58% when I did the math, are insects. So insects are making up over half of all known living organisms. That's huge, huge amount of diversity going on there. And within insecta, there is a lot of diversity. So some groups are more diverse than others. So we're looking at another pie chart here, and instead of looking at all of life, we're looking at all of the insects. And we see this section down on the bottom right in green that says Coleoptera. Those are the beetles, and beetles are making up about 40% of all of insects. So if we do that math and go back out to all of life, that means beetles are making up about 20% of all of life. <laughs> so one in every five living species, plants, animals, vertebrates, non-vertebrates, is a beetle. Beetles are crazy diverse, and they are absolutely everywhere. And we have all of these other groups of insects as well. We have our flies, we have our wasps, our butterflies, our moths, everything else in between. There is a huge amount of diversity that is sort of locked up in the insect world. So with so many different kinds of insects, we see so much variation, but a lot of that variation is all just happening on a common theme. So all of these insects have that same body plan. They have the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. They have the six legs. Most of them have the four wings. And what we're seeing that makes them so different is modification of those exact same body parts repeatedly. So one really good example is looking at different insect legs. The legs can look so, so very different because they've been modified to function in different ways to allow the insect to take advantage of different habitats. So we have on the upper left, we have the mole crickets. Its four legs are like these really beefy, muscular looking digging tools. And that's literally what they're there for. They dig, they tunnel. That is what those four legs have been adapted for. If you look underneath it at the praying mantis, it also has some big beefy forearms, but they look very different than the digging cricket forearms. These are made for catching prey. They're raptorial and they're meant for snapping out and catching another insect and holding it in place. We have other insects that are aquatic where their legs have been modified to look basically like boat oars. They've been flattened and they're meant for pushing water. These are swimming legs. We have legs that you see in grasshoppers. The hind legs um, are usually meant for jumping. We see a lot of modification in antennal structures in insects. So this has to do with um, how they're gonna be sensing their environment largely. So we have insects whose antennae look like bits of thread, like beads on string. Ants are known for having what we call geniculate antennae. They have an elbow bend, like a right, perfect right turn in their, in their antennae. Uh, we have lamellate antennae, where it looks like they have a stack of plates at the end of the antennae. We have big fluffy plumose antennae. We see a lot of variety in mouth parts and insects. And these look super different between a moth's coiled proboscis, meant for sipping nectar, between toothed mandibles, meant for chewing up other insects, for sponging parts in flies, for stabbing parts in predatorial insects. But these are all modifications of the exact same mouth parts. They look super, super different now, but I promise you that their basis all come from the exact same anatomical structures. And all of these different modifications into the different body parts, again, is what is allowing these insects to sort of diversify and take advantage of different habitats, different regions, and sort of um, own the niches that they live in. So we find insects in all sorts of different places. So we have terrestrial habitats where insects are living up in the tree trunks, they're living up in the canopy, they might be living underground, maybe associated with the roots of plants. We've got insects in meadows and prairies and grasslands. We have them living 
inside the plants and really symbiotic relationships with those plants. We have a variety of aquatic habitats where some things are maybe living on top of the surface of the water exclusively. Some things are living in the water column. Sometimes they're living exclusively in lotic environments where the water is moving. They might be moving or living in lentic environments where the water is still. We have mosquito species that can go from egg to adult in seven days. So they're taking advantage of those really ephemeral short lived waters. Um, things like heavy rains where they're leaving a puddle for numerous days are something that these particular mosquito species love because they have evolved to take advantage of the short lived water source. And we have insects who have evolved in response to things like us, and they thrive in urban and structural habitats. So things like termites, carpenter ants, bed bugs, um, these things thrive in environments that we have made and created. So insects really have invaded everywhere. It's the insects world, and we just sort of live in it with them. All right, so I'm stressing all of this variation and diversity present in the insect world. So I'm trying to make the point that for as much as we do know about insects, there's probably a lot more that we don't know about them. There's so much going on in the insect world. If you can think of a thing that possibly could be, it probably already exists in the insects, whether we know about it yet or not. But there's a huge, massive amount of variety and diversity. And that leads us up to the question, how many insect species are there here in Minnesota? If we know that we have about a million described species in the world that we know of, how many of those occur here in Minnesota? So there are some groups of insects that we know really, really well here in Minnesota. Um, people really like damselflies, dragonflies, butterflies. Those are beautiful. They tend to be favorites. And so we know a lot about them and we tend to have resources that help us to identify them help us learn about them. There's some other groups, tiger beetles and flower flies that are also quite um, popular, excuse me. Uh, but these represent just a fraction of all the different insects that we know are here in Minnesota. There's many, many, many other insects that live in Minnesota aside from uh, the most popular ones. And rather than make today's talk about all of these really popular ones, because there are so many resources and guides available, like really good ones that you can get to teach yourself about some of these. I thought it maybe would be more interesting to tackle what we don't know instead of what we do know. All right, so to launch into that, I would like to take just 30 seconds and have you turn to um, a friend or a seatmate, a family member, and just chat for a second about how many insect species you think we have in Minnesota. Thinking about the variation in the diversity, there's no wrong answer here, it's just a guess. Would anybody like to share their guess? Right here in the front. 100,000 in the pink group. A little louder? 25,000. Any other guesses somebody wants to put out there? These are all fabulous guesses. All right, so the answer is, I don't know. I don't know. Um, we don't know exactly. There's probably a lot of people in the state with um, a university or various you know, agencies or institutions who could make very educated guesses, but we don't have a reliable published checklist of the insects of Minnesota. We have um, you know, our individual sources where maybe they're specific to a group of insects, maybe they're specific to the North Woods, maybe someone has written a park or a bog. Um, but we don't know, by and large, how many insects are in the state of Minnesota. Um, and some of you might be thinking, you manage the insect collection at the university. <laughs> you have about 140 years worth of insects collected from across the state in your care. How can you not know? <laughs> um, that is such an excellent question as well. So when we started the insect collection, when whoever started the collection 140 years ago, it started with a couple thousand specimens collected around the North Shore. It was a very regional reference collection. And it has grown to what it is now with over 4 million. And 100, yes, so over 4 million individual specimens now, it's grown quite a bit. 
Um, and you can imagine when the insect collection first started, digital databasing was not a thing. So the protocol was to accept insects in, organize them carefully. If you came to me and had a species in mind, I would know exactly where to go in the insect collection to physically find those specimens, look at the locality labels attached to them, and tell you if we had any specimens that had been collected in Minnesota versus Wisconsin versus North Dakota versus anywhere in the country. And I could tell you, yes, we have specimens from Minnesota of that. Um, but I would have to then do that for all 4 million individual specimens to give you a list of everything that we have collected in Minnesota. Um, and that is actually something that we are working on. <laughs> so we are working on now being able to compile that information so that we can answer questions like that. We are slowly transcribing label, label data. We are going through groups of insects, trying to figure out what we have, making that information available. So putting it into, instead of just paperwork, into an actual digital database so we can share the information with the researchers and with the general public. And that's what's really interesting. But unfortunately, we have a very small portion of the insect collection database at this point. So we don't have an answer to the question of how many species there are in Minnesota, despite having like, the raw data around us to answer that question. So what I think we're going to talk about today for the rest of the time is how do we get to that answer? How can we maybe make our best educated guess now as we do the work to get to a really specific answer? So to start with our best educated guess, I'm gonna talk about some experiments that were done at the Cedar Creek Ecosystem Science Reserve um, up in Anoka County, Minnesota. So that's um, maybe, maybe an hour, less than an hour um, from the Twin Cities. So it's not too far away, but there's a lot of major experiments that get run out there by you, my faculty and staff. So this first experiment is called the Big Biodiversity Experiment. Um, they had 168 plots of land. Each one was 13 by 13 meters. And they had 36 plants that they planted in those plots in different iterations and different combinations. And this experiment wasn't necessarily trying to figure out how many insect species there were there. It was very interested in how biodiversity of plants might support biodiversity of insects. So they were interested in which combinations of plants were hosting how many different species of insects, things like that. So this was a nice, um, small, controlled starting point. Um, can anybody pick out things that we might be missing in this experiment that would help us find out which insects were in the area? Trees, there's no trees in these plots, right? So it's very artificial. It's just these 36 plants that are grown in them. <laughs> Variety of temperature. So if this was done only at a certain point in the summer, we would be missing a lot of seasonal data. <laughs> No source of water again. So we're excluding, we're excluding habitats. We're excluding um, seasonal variation. So this is clearly like just step one because we can already identify some things that are missing. But again, that's okay because it wasn't necessarily the point of the experiment. So we're sort of using the results of these experiments in an unintended way. And so what they ended up finding was that on those 36 plants in the different combinations throughout the plots was that there were 685 species of insect that were supported by those plants. So just in those small 168 plots with no trees, no water, um, not a lot of seasonal variation, 685 species. That's impressive for just a small amount of area for the first time we did it. If we wanted to take a step larger and look outside of those plots, there was another sort of experiment run outside of Cedar Creek. Um, so there was a biologist there for many years. His name was John Harstead. He unfortunately passed away in 2007. Uh, but we have um, some of the work that he did, which is um, huge. I use this list all the time. So he created the Insects of Cedar Creek, where he was trying to put together a survey of all of the insects in all of Cedar Creek. So this was expanding off of just those experimental plots and trying to figure out across the whole reserve what insects are here. And he did this by being able to take the data from things like those major experiments. So things like the plot experiment, other experiments that were being run for different reasons. And if they turned up insects in their results, he was able to take those and sort of put them into his survey. He did casual collecting across the reserve when he was um, out at the park, out of the reserve. And he was able to put together a list of insects just based off of um, basically accumulating things from different sources, a little bit here, a little bit there. And he put together a list that was roughly about 4,000 different species of insect just at Cedar Creek. Um, and he was very forthcoming that this was not comprehensive in any way. He barely got into the aquatic species. I think the dragonflies were represented, but the rest of the aquatics were sort of missed. 
Um, he didn't really do any um, night sampling very much. So a lot of nocturnal stuff was missed. I don't think he was out there in the winter. I don't think. So he would be missing any winter emergers. So he was very forthcoming that this was an attempt at comprehensive survey, but it was not a comprehensive survey. His guess, based on his personal experience, was that there's anywhere between five and 10,000 insect species just at the Cedar Creek Reserve, even though he only turned up about 4,000. So if we wanted to go out and start doing a survey of insects across Cedar Creek, laid out, we want to do a survey across Minnesota, what would that look like? What sort of efforts do we have to make if we want to survey the insects? Um, there are so many different collecting methods that could be used. I have entire lectures for courses that I teach that are dedicated just to how do we sample the insects. And I'm only going to go over here because we're, we don't have an hour to just talk about different kinds of nets. Uh, but one of the most common traditional historic ways is with a sweep net, where you have this nice mesh net, you take it out with you, you sweep a few grasses, you sweep a few canopy, you sweep a few foliage, and you look in the net and you see what you've caught. Very traditional. Uh, this little device on the right-hand side is called an aspirator. You basically use that to, you inhale through one side and suck an insect up the other, and they end up in your little tube. It's a great way to collect small things, very, very common. These are very labor intensive. These are active means of collecting. They only function when you're out there working. So a con to this is that they're only collecting when you are, but a pro is that they're very targeted and specific. So if you know what you're looking for, you can go out and target it very specifically. If you were interested in a passive type of sampling method, you might go with something called a malaise trap. This is also very common. So on the left-hand side is an example of a malaise trap that was put up in the field. It looks sort of like a tent, but instead of having walls on the outside, the outside is open and the wall is down the middle. So any insect that goes flying by hits that middle wall. A lot of insects' natural reaction when it hits something is to go up. So it will fly up, it will hit the roof, it will be funneled up to the very top where you can see a jar or a bottle up at that peak. That bottle is filled with some sort of killing agent, some sort of preservative. I like ethanol in these situations. And the insects will sort of fall into that bottle after being funneled up and they'll be collected there. This is super nice because I can leave a malaise trap out for a week, for two weeks, for however long I want, and it will be collecting for me the entire time. So I don't have to be actively spending my time out there doing it. The downside is that it's collecting everything that happens to stumble into its grasp. So it's not a targeted means of collection. And this is what happens when we have a not targeted means of collection. This dish is one malaise trap sample that I think was out for less than a week. And it is just a soup of little bodies in there. So if you want to know what you caught, you have to go through that whole soup and pick through every single little body to figure out what you caught. So you're getting a much bigger bulk sample. You are um, not having to be actively doing the work yourself the entire time, but now the back end is that you have a lot of sorting and identifying to because you've caught so much more. But these would be common means of insect surveying, um, either going out and sweeping and aspirating or maybe running things like malaise traps. But depending on what you want to do, how much work you've just made for yourself. All right, so as an example of what we see when we start to expand our collecting area from a plot in an experiment, to an entire reserve, to across the whole state. I thought we would focus on one group of insects as an example that tend to be pretty well loved and generally better known, uh, Lepidoptera, which are better known as moths and butterflies. So the trend that we're seeing as we move from left to right, from column to column, is that the numbers are getting bigger. We have our Cedar Creek plots in total, which are you know, less than a square mile. We have Cedar Creek as an entire reserve, which is about eight, eight and a half square miles. And then the state of Minnesota, which is almost 87,000 square miles. And the results from that big biodiversity plot experiment that I started talking about, they had 685 insect species they found, 28 of them were butterflies or moths. When we scale up to all of Cedar Creek, out of the 4,000 insects that John Harstad found, 294 of them were butterflies or moths. So we're getting bigger which we would expect because we're covering more habitats, we're covering more sampling methods, we're covering more plants that support more insects, you would expect to see more. And then I have a nice perfect number for the state of Minnesota, 1,740 insect or butterfly and moth species. So I told you how little we know about our own insect collection. How do I know <laughs> that we have 1,740 butterflies and moths? I did tell you we were starting to work on it, and that was our starting point. One of the very first um, 
collection gathering missions that we went on, databasing experiments we started, was with the butterflies and moths of North America. So we've gone through our butterflies and moths, and we have transcribed the data from most, <laughs> we're not done yet, but most of the butterflies and moths found in Minnesota. And what we have in our collection is almost 2,000, about 1,700 different species of butterflies and moths. So that's everything that we have in our collection telling us we have at least 1,740 species of butterfly and moth in the state of Minnesota. We haven't done a comprehensive survey going out to do field work specifically for that purpose. So if we went out looking for more, we would almost certainly find more. But based on what we just happen to have, we know that we have at least this many in the state of Minnesota. If we wanna look at another example, we can also look at the bees. We have five or six different families of bees present in the state of Minnesota. And in the big biodiversity plot experiment, they found 33 species of bees. John Harstead found 119 across Cedar Creek. But we know we have 508 species of bee here in the state of Minnesota. And that is, again, I can give you that very specific number for the bees because of research that's being done at the university between the U of M Bee Lab and the Department of Natural Resources. They've been going through our bee collection with a fine tooth comb, looking for specimens collected in Minnesota historically, they found out, and they've been doing their own contemporary survey work in the prairies and the broadleaf forests. They have this recent publication, um, I have a citation up in the left-hand corner for anyone who's interested, and they put together a checklist of the bees of Minnesota, and they decided we have 508 species of bees present in Minnesota. That's amazing. Minnesota is not known for being a hot spot of biodiversity, but to say that we have 508 species of just bees, that's not counting wasps and ants and all the other close relatives, it's just bees. That's amazing. And nobody knew that before they went through all of these specimens to find it out, even though we have the data sitting there right in front of us. So these are specific groups of insects that we've been able to put these very real numbers on. Specifically, I'm just talking about butterflies and moths, specifically talking about the bees, so how do we move out from there and figure out how many insect species in total we have in Minnesota? And the challenge comes from just the sheer number of insects that exist, the sheer abundance. If I want to pick through that Malays trap, I'm going to see the same insects over and over and over and over again, but I have to go through every single one to make sure that I'm not missing something that might be in there. So in terms of diversity and just sheer abundance, it is a huge challenge to figure this stuff out. <laughs> All right, so here is a summary of what we've covered so far. We have our numbers for Lepidoptera, we have our numbers for the bees. We know that Cedar Creek, the big biodiversity experiment turned up 685 total species of insects. We know John Harstead found roughly 4,000. And we're back to our original question of how many insect species do we have in the state of Minnesota? So Let's think about it. Um, we have four different biomes here in Minnesota. So a biome is a large area that gets characterized by its vegetation, by its soil, by its climate, by its wildlife. And all of those factors are things that would sort of influence our insect diversity in those different regions. We would expect to see um, some generalist species that might exist in numerous biomes. We would expect to see some specialist species that are specific to a biome. We would expect to see some habitats in specific biomes where we're gonna see extremely specialist species. Things like bogs tend to have a very specific insect fauna. Um, in addition to the geographic and the habitat variety that we have in Minnesota, there's gonna be our typical seasonal variation. So we see different things in the spring versus the summer versus the fall. And we do have winter emerging insects here in Minnesota. So we have insect activity in the winter as well. We have you know, very distinct insect activity throughout the year. Um, there are some insects that are specialists seasonally. There are early spring emerging bees that are taking advantage of the early emerging spring flowers. And then after those flowers are gone, we really don't see those bees for the rest of the year. They're very, very hard to detect after that. Um, so we've got a lot of variation to take into account when we try to make our educated guess. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to talk to your seat mate again. And after we've talked about all the variation that we see and some of the numbers that we're getting from Cedar Creek, if anyone wants to take a second guess at how many insects they think we see in Minnesota, we'll share them.
Maybe 20 more seconds. Would anyone like to share their updated guess? Yeah. 110,000. Okay. <laughs> 150,000. Way back by the window. 100,000. So our guesses went way up. <laughs> I don't blame you. 220,000. These are amazing guesses. All right, so based on what we have databased in the U of N Insect Collection, I did a sweep through the database to find out how many I can tell you for certain that we have. We have at least 3,890. <laughs> now we know that that's actually a really small number. <laughs> it's less than what John Hart said turned up at just Cedar Creek. And I'm going to stress that this is in no way comprehensive of what we actually have in the state. This is just what we've managed to database. And again, we have database a very small portion of the insect collection. This is the equivalent of having a library with no CAD card card opening system, no Dewey Decimal System. You just have a building full of books, and you don't know how many you have. We don't know which insect species we have for Minnesota, but we have almost four thousand for sure. Uh, so far, we really. Uh, we haven't done many of the beetles, which we know are super diverse. We talked about beetles earlier in the lecture, and we realized that beetles are one in every five species on Earth. And we've databased barely any of our beetles. We've barely touched the wasp. We haven't touched flies. There's huge, massive, super diverse groups of insects in our insect collection that we haven't touched yet because it's just huge amounts of work to get all that data from a specimen into a digital format that we can then work with. But so based on what we know about the specific groups we do have good coverage on, the butterflies and the moths, the bees, thinking about the groups that we don't have any coverage on, thinking about the numbers that we found at Cedar Creek, comparing proportionately, my conservative guess is that we have for certain over 20,000. I think we probably have closer to 25,000. There is every possibility that we have 100,000, over 100,000 species. But my conservative guess is that in the state of Minnesota, we probably have maybe 24,000 insect species, which is amazing. Um, it's so many species when you think about it. Um, and I actually do think that that's amazing. Uh, I don't think that the fact that I can't give you the exact number is um, disappointing. What I actually think is that it's really inspiring. And I think that it's amazing that I don't have a convenient concise answer. It's really interesting to think about all the stuff that we don't know yet. It's really exciting to think about how can we figure it out? What sort of research projects can we do to help us get there? And what are we going to find along the way that's going to send us down however many other like paths of research? So I want to thank you for <laughs> listening to me fumble my way through that answer of how many insect species we have in Minnesota. And I would be super happy to hear your thoughts or take any questions. <laughs>